to start off, before we get into like kind of discussing the specifics of this case, I just want to want to sort of lay out my understanding. Of course, feel free to jump in, interrupt any point. So the Corporation Commission is a is a constitutional body that regulates uh, utilities. Uh, they used to re- regulate telecom telecoms in the past, but um, they regulate regulate a lot of oil and gas stuff, and they have a very structured process for kind of how these regulated monopolies like OG&E, uh, Oklahoma Natural Gas, uh, PSO, um, do their business in the state. But they, my understanding, just from a political standpoint, is that they're an incredibly powerful entity. I mean, they were, they're in the Constitution. It's three elected officials that sit on this body they have a whole staff and, you know, ability to fund that. So, I mean, they've got, you know, a lot of resources to really understand what's going on, who's responsible for what. And, and, and a lot of – and so the two cases I'm probably the most familiar with are rate cases and this one that we'll be talking about here, which is a fuel charge case. And so without getting too in the weeds and losing everybody at the start of this <laughs> – OG&E, ONG, these, these companies have to go to the Corporation Commission basically to do almost anything that involves charging customers. So like in a rate case, like there, there are rules about how they get reimbursed for, you know, building power plants or pipelines. And there's also rules about how they get paid back for fuel charges. And so like in this case, like fuel charges, they can't mark up, but there is a process for determining whether these were reasonable charges and whether they can pass them on to the customer or not. Right. I think that's a fairly simple and direct setup. I mean, is there more you would add to that? Or well, I would just say that this, this particular case is, is a fuel related case, but it's not a strict fuel that, you know, every year all these utilities use fuel, whether it's natural gas or, or, or um, you know, coal or whatever else. Um, they always, pass those costs directly on the customers in their bill. You see that your fuel charge is based on what they're paying for that commodity, essentially. Um, and they to go normally in normal times outside of these extreme weather events, they go through this kind of true up process and the, co- the corporation commission staff there, the public utility division goes through and says like usually every month or every quarter, um, here's what we think we'll allow on this. You know, this was not a great purchase, but you know, hindsight, we can't question that you, was it reasonable at the time possibly? And so they, they'll adjust it to make sure that our bills are not going out of whack. I mean, especially um, we've dealt with this in the past. We've had some, you know, previous cases where natural gas spiked, uh, not to the level it was in February this year, but I mean, we've had spikes where it was going from, you know, $2 a thousand cubic feet to $16 for a decent period of time. And that all got passed through the customer's bill. So they, they come in every, you know, and do that monthly, but they also have an, an annual review to kind of say, look what we did. And so that is so it's set up a similar way. It's not as contentious as a rate case because rate cases, you have many different parties who are interested, um, you know, on a typical rate case, uh, depending on what it's about, you're going to have um, obviously the, the company itself, the utility, you're going to have um, the public utility division has its own role in that case to kind of keep everything running smoothly for the regulatory process. Uh, the attorney general's office comes in on that, acting specifically on behalf of consumers. That is their one person that can guarantee a consumer voice other than just lobbying the commissioner directly as a consumer uh, is the AG's office. And then you'll have other groups that, that are interested. Obviously, the um, AARP is very active in a lot of these cases because, you know, seniors are typically on fixed income and the right. fuel purchase is a, a decent part of their, their outlays every month. And then, you know, all the way down the line for You've got groups of industrial consumers that are looking out for their large customers' um, interests. You've got, you know, Walmart jumps in sometimes. In the past, you've seen hospitals jump in because they're large power users. Uh, Definitely on, you know, some of the more environmental cost cases that come up, you have the Sierra Club is very active. um, Mm -hmm. A lot of these things kind of saying, you know, pushing you towards more greener energy and retiring some of the, the blacker and grayer energy that's out there like coal. So there's a lot of parties around the room and this one is, you know, similar in that it's a fuel case, but they're asking for permission to sell these bonds. And I think you can probably talk a little bit more about how those bonds got 
put into place earlier this year at the legislature. Yeah, so let, let's set that up real quick. So now we're going to talk about this specific fuel charge case, which I think I can say this without being too hyperbolic. It is the largest fuel charge case in the in Oklahoma history, probably by a factor of many times over. So what happened was last February, if you remember, 2021, well, it hasn't even been a year, guys. Is, we're still in the same year of our Lord, 2021. The Oklahoma had a, a historic cold snap for, you know, a week-long period. It got incredibly cold in Oklahoma. Historically long, it, a point I like to make is it did not actually get as cold. Like, we, Oklahoma State never broke its all-time record low, just to put it in perspective. But it did get cold for many, many days. And over, like, they, you know, this timeline kind of fluctuates a little bit, but like a five-day period, but really it was maybe a two-day period, natural gas prices soared. And you saw a spike. So natural gas prices have been between like 2 and $9 for 25 years, shot up for a, like a, a, in a one-day period to $1,100 uh, per million BTU, which is like their unit of measurement for natural gas. This caused OG&E and ONG to purchase natural gas a fuel they use for peaking units, which are power plants that kick in when we have high demand, they purchase more natural gas in these few days than they do in like two years. So what what people were saying back when it happened was if, if they had just said, like on your next bill, if they had just said, hey, you owe all this today, it would have been, you know, people have seen bills for thousands and thousands of dollars, you know, more than many families can reasonably afford to pay. And so... Fast forward, the legislature, like OG&E and ONG, just so you know, just they went out and just bought this stuff. So like they had enough money, enough capital, enough whatever credit to go out and just say like, give us, give us money. We're buying this gas. We got to keep the lights on. We got to keep the gas flowing. So the legislature passed a process called securitization. And all that is is a fancy term for we're going to stretch this debt out over some time period. And they're going to run it through a state agency that does large-scale bonding, even though this will be much larger than they've ever done. Um, but it'll let them, it'll let us stretch out the cost over, as as we'll get into in this case now, decades. So that is, all, a lot of this is very, I mean, it's all unusual. You know, the weather was weird. The securitization is new. And so now we're at this case. And typically, there's like a whole process, like you know, like like a rate case. I think on a fuel charge, I, I would I would equate a fuel charge case of this magnitude to a rate case because it's so much money that everyone's really interested in what happens. You know, we're used to a process where it's like you know hearings for multiple days. There's all these attorneys that get in, and you know, you interview witnesses and do all this stuff. They didn't do any of that. They they have nego- as of last Friday, they negotiated a deal called a joint stipulation and settlement agreement. And here we are on Monday morning, we found out, you know, deal's kind of done. It, the terms are like 28 years, roughly $2 a month from OG&E. But OG&E is just the first one. Like th- this case is unprecedented. But it's just the first one. PSO is going to come back. ONG is going to come back. But like, let's talk about this case now. So you've got this 28-year joint stipulation. You know, what are the options now? Like, they, they, there's a, a what's called an administrative law judge that's going to rule on this to say, like, here's my opinion, legal opinion on it. We won't know what that'll be probably until November sometime. But like, what 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 can the Corporation Commission do? With this, so yeah, they, they they've got the stipulation, and, and basically just means it's a settlement. I mean, that's generally what I mean. They, they have regulatory has their own terms of art and acronyms. It's just it's, it's a mile long of stuff like that. But it's basically a settlement that not all the parties that were involved in this case signed off on. So, you know, the two biggest parties that are not signed onto this is you know, AARP has not approved the stipulation, and the Attorney General's office has not approved it. And I don't know if we know exactly what the AG's opinion on this is yet. I don't know if they've filed a response or if they will file a response. I haven't seen it. Um, but generally, I mean, you know, the, the Corporation Commission would like most cases to get settled or have a stipulation because it's less work for everybody involved. Not work basis, but it's just less complicated. I mean, you're right. I mean, normally they're, 
the hearings are all laid out. You know, the good part about the Corporation Commission is that everybody's input is already in their case file. So like even before the hearing started, they already had, you know, the other parties question OGE and say, why didn't you do this, this and this? No genie responded. So those are all written down in the filings and the rebuttal testimony. It's already out there. So we already kind of have a good idea of where the parties were going to lie before the hearing was supposed to start on Monday. Um, and so you kind of know where people have staked out their positions and what they're going to ask about. And of course, during a normal hearing, the administrative law judge sits in there. Occasionally, you'll have a commissioner or two jump in and out just to hear because uh, it's such a large case. I'm sure there's a lot of, of interest in that too. Um, but they, you know, they want a settlement generally just because it gets at night, it's tied up. But the, the corporation commission can say no. And, you know, the ALJ will make the recommendation. Um, and then it goes to the corporation commissioners themselves to vote on it. And, you know, with this many parties that are involved in these typical things, especially when you've got the public utility division signing off on it, you've got um, the industrial consumers group, OEIC, uh, which is a larger industrial, you know, users of the system there. And then, you know, obviously the OGE Shareholders Association, which is a separate party. It's interesting to me. It's always been interesting. They have a shareholder association that jumps in on here and making sure that the shareholders or interests are protected. Um, Don't want them taking on any uh, any of this risk. Right. So, and then, you know, generally we've got Walmart is obviously signed off on this because they're a large, you know, yeah. consumer, but they're not always aligned with other large consumers. Sometimes they are like the industrial folks, but Walmart has, is big enough and has ma enough stores and is a big enough user that they have their own people to kind of check on their bills as well. Um, yeah. You know, and the so, and the, People just to you made the point, but I just want to reinforce for folks watching the people's lawyer in all this is supposed to be the attorney general. Um, you know, we had a previous attorney general who actually was on uh, Mike Hunter had actually been uh, staff, I think, at the Corporation Commission. He had or he had been like their general counsel or something at some point. I think my a while ago, yeah, before he was at the land office and then before he went off to, you know, insurance in D.C. lobbying. So, um, so we've traded Mike Hunter, who had a lot of expertise in uh, public utility rate cases, and now have John O'Connor, who um, is just like a, comes out of the corporate world and, and has a lot of allegiances there. So that's that, that's also very interesting, and from uh, our my standpoint, you know. I mean, to be fair, to the AG's office, I mean, they haven't weighed in from the top, or, or as far as I know, on this case specifically. But they they've got career people inside the AG's consumer unit that that know this stuff backwards and forwards. And in yeah. fact, I've seen holdovers, you know, from you know when um, Attorney General Emmonson moved, you know, and then it, it got to uh, Pruitt. I mean, they held over those folks because they have such wide experience with these cases. They're almost somewhat apolitical because they're, they're looking out for the consumer and you know obviously the ag sets a tone at the top and in fact we saw that under scott pruitt he just begged off on a couple of cases and yeah. said i'm not going to enter even have a witness for the consumer side on this which was you know questionable if you were worried about that consumer impact um but and, and pretty rare i mean that was pruitt was one of the first was probably the first attorney general not to have an active you know defense for the consumer in some of these cases um and and as we uh, right now, like they haven't endorsed or opposed the stipulation, so mm -hmm. it's like kind of a, I mean, you know, to me, silence is violence or whatever. Like you know, like if you're not going to say anything, uh, I mean, that's probably not great. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, from, to, to, be, from to be true, I mean, it's I know it seems that they put this stipulation out last Friday. Um, you know, we're still a week after that, so I mean, things don't move super fast a lot of times in the utility regulation world. So there there may be. They may be studying it. They may be trying to, you know, figure out if there's a way they can get in here and make it a little better for consumers. Um, you know, the stipulate stipulation says it's basically saving about a hundred million on what they first asked for, um, and so the and it's stretched out rather than like I think 13 years was original plan. Now it's going to be 28, and so the bills are going to be like rather than four dollars a month, it'd be two dollars for a typical customer extra. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, but, you know, it gets back to, you know, it's rare to have a fuel case or fuel cost over decades. I mean, you see it in putting a power plant up, which is extremely expensive, you know, seven, eight hundred million dollars to build a new power plant. 
it makes sense. It's got a useful life of 60 years to put that on a long-term financing plan and have it paid off each year through the regular rate price process. But, you know, your kids, my kids are going to be paying these fuel bills decades down the road. For fuel 15 years after my son um, graduates from college, he will still days. be paying OG and e their extra yeah. fuel charge, you know, for two or three days. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, almost like buying your grandfather's gas on a car from, you know, <laughs> the sixties yeah. or whatever, like, uh, still put on a credit card somehow for you uh, somewhere yeah. to pay off. But, um, well, and so let's, let's talk about that. Cause I don't want us to run out too far of time. Um, so the, the central argument here is about re- prudent and reasonable. Like that, that is like in a fuel case, that is what the corporation commission is supposed to be looking at is like, was this reasonable and prudent? And I have sort of like just in my brain boiled it down to two ways you could make that argument. Was it reasonable and prudent to keep the gas and lights on for people while they could freeze to death? Yeah, no shit. Like, yes, like keep the gas and lights on. We don't want people freezing to death and dying. But the other question then is, is was it reasonable and prudent to be so exposed to commodity markets, which is that's where this $1,100 per million BTU thing came from, was OG&E just had ridiculous exposure to spot markets, which is so when the demand and supply got out of whack and the prices went basically to infinity, OG and E just had to pay it because they weren't ready to do anything else. And so, I mean, I don't think that's very prudent and reasonable to be that exposed. And then secondarily, using kind of your argument about it makes sense to securitize, you know, this huge capital investment, like we're basically paying a huge capital investment worth of cost for nothing like we get nothing but very expensive fuel for this it's like if if on the other hand in a better more reasonable and prudent world og and e had spent say half this amount you know 350 million weatherizing their shit you know being prepared for a cold day we'd save ourselves 50 percent. and so like i think there's like a reasonable and prudence argument on their previous investment strategy that clearly didn't work um, and so it's like, a, it's a, it's kind of a, yeah, I mean, a two tier thing. Like, yes, you should keep the gas and lights on so people don't freeze to death, but then you should also have done your job better. So you weren't in this position in the first place. Yeah. And I think some of the parties raised those issues in some of their, their testimony. I mean, you know, obviously the reasonable and prudent standard, you know, you, it, it's, it's not supposed to be a substitute for hindsight because, you know, if you yeah. say hindsight, well, you could say all day long, what somebody should have done. Um, you know, and OGD will probably say, well, we did keep the lights on. We had our people working extraordinarily hard. We had stuff freeze off from wellheads that were supply issues. We had, you know, wind turbines freeze or, or, you know, we had that stuff going on. So we had to deal with all that internally. And we were asked at the time another state emergency to keep things running, you know, for the most number of people. I mean, contrast to Texas when they did have massive blackouts, completely lost power. For, for days and weeks at a time um, based on inadequate weatherization probably is what it's looking like down in Texas. I mean, yeah. you know, that was raised by some of the parties here in Oklahoma and OGNE's kind of said, well, we did what we could and, you know, we could weatherize everything, but we're still going to, someone's got to pay for that at some point um, for like a once in a generation storm like this or cold snap or whatever. Uh, so you've but got, then, I mean, to that point though, then when you securitize out over 28 years, I mean, you, you are securitizing it for right. a generation. Like, I mean, so I don't know, it doesn't really make your argument that strong, but you keep, keep going. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I, I guess part of it too is, you know, the rush, I don't know. I don't know if there's been a rush. I mean, it seems like it's just very quickly is going on and obviously nobody wants to delay anything because we've already OG&E's paid their people, essentially. They haven't gotten yeah. the money back yet. So they've paid everybody they were they were supposed to when it happened. In fact, they took out a billion-dollar like loan um, without any guarantee that it was going to ever be paid back, and that's why they're coming before the commission now. But um, you know, it, the stipulation does also include a, a couple interesting parts that are non-financial. So they basically like og is supposed to do, conduct a study on how it weatherizes, how it procures natural gas, um, you know, whether or not should be a hedging as a strategy for that, because hedging is something that obviously people point to is like, why didn't they hedge? Yeah. And og and I think probably technically had the flexibility to fled, to hedge, but it's not been a typical use of their procurement. I mean, in fact, they've said 
we tried to ask, you know, hedging gets pretty expensive sometimes because somebody's got to pay the hedging costs. Um, and if you're, if the market's in your favor, it's a great deal. But if it's not, you're still paying something. Sure. Um, and so they would say, well, we've asked the corporation commission before to hedge more of our fuel portfolio. And in fact, they said about a decade ago, they proposed to do some hedging. They got a bunch of outcry and they withdrew their application. So, yeah. you know, I mean, there's that part of it too, where hedging is not the only solution. Maybe they could have done different types of purchases. There's, you know, index pricing, there's first of the month pricing, you know, and that's what people have kind of raised in some of these interveners, but you know, they are supposed to be studying it if the stipulation is approved. So, so I want to talk to, so somebody mentioned hedging. I think you covered that question. And then another thing is, is, is I want to talk kind of about like they're going to do studies on this. And, and there's a question about like there's never a downside for them. You know, seems like we should incentivize them caring to do the smarter thing. And this is something that really speaks to like my political argument about this is, you know, if we ram this through and we do this, like you've created like a path of least resistance where they're going to go down this path. And like if it happens again, like they'll just do the same thing because it's way easier to just pass these costs on to all of us than it is to like go do the hard work of like fighting to, to weatherize stuff or push back on your suppliers to, you know, not take advantage of you when it gets cold and all this other stuff. Um, and, and one area where I think like one, there was a, the hearing the other day or actually during the public comment, they had a meeting back in September where they had Continental, og and ONG, and PSO all come and present like their findings or their response to this. And like, I mean, I appreciate that it was Dana Murphy, one of the corporation commissioners that organized it. Like, I appreciate it. Like, get them on the record. Like, let's hear what they have to say. But these slide decks were so pathetic and so amateur and so just like toothless. Like, it was like, yeah, we'll like look at some stuff and we might try to, you know, I don't know. We'll maybe deal with it, but probably not. I mean, it was just the language was so loose. There was no specifics. Like I think the longest deck was like 11 slides. And it's like, you know, this very powerful regulator who has the ability to like really push back on you in a serious way asks you to come and give us some real information. And you put together something that is like, so amateurish and vague like I, I to me it was just very insulting um and it just it obviously just showed they have no either idea or intention of like unless somebody makes some like no they don't have a real intention of like sorting this out at least well, not I mean, anytime soon <laughs> yeah i think back when this all happened i mean i think you had some allegations of price gouging and i i, I think at the time it was you know former ag mike hunter who may have mentioned that they're investigating but i don't know if anything came of that and of course he left office in the summer um and then so our new ag i don't know if he's picked that up or if even if it's a, an issue for say the multi-county grand jury that they're looking at kind of in, in secret or what but we haven't really heard much on that front lately um so I, I i don't know you know what might come of something like that because you're right i mean the spot prices were were huge i mean unprecedented levels um for those and some of them were that. like like at the one Oak terminal, which is like the parent company of Oklahoma natural gas. So it's like, you know, did, was it dozens of suppliers and storage companies and midstream companies that, you know, found ways to get gas onto the market in a crisis, or is it like two, three, four players that are very corporately related to each other? I mean, I think the public really deserves to know that. And Supposedly, it's in some of the filings. Like, like you have to be an intervener to get like access to some of the internal documents. But I mean, I, I just I am very curious if the public can find that stuff, or if like you know, the reporters can you know get out there and get access to some of those documents because you know if it's if you know three companies made up eighty percent of all the the price gouging or you know or all the fuel charges I, ha I have to believe the public would be pretty annoyed about that like yeah i mean th there is part of it too is i mean we're not you know we were we're in oklahoma we were obviously a, a huge pipeline crossroads but we're not we weren't at that time and we don't typically bring in a bunch of gas from outside of the state i mean because we have so much gas production here we pretty much use it 
all here or send it out of state. We're not an importer generally of gas, I don't sure. think, as far as I know. And so those, but you're right. I mean, there are, I mean, if you have an affiliate that's a gas, you know, pipeline or whatever, I mean, you know, the standard is an arm's length transaction. And of course, that's what, that's what the uh, corporation commissioners to guarantee that that was done on an arm's length basis. You can do business with affiliates for sure, but there has to be, you know, this corporation got rules about that and they can come back and ask you pretty detailed questions about that too. So, you know, a, a part of this too is that SPP, which we haven't talked about yet, which is the Southwest yeah. Power Pool, basically, you know, Oklahoma parts or all of 10 other states in this huge section of the country. Um, it's it's basically our local grid. I mean, it's not technically set up that way, but it's the way the market is set up in this area to share power um, and, you know, everyone that's a utility in that footprint is selling market power into that market every day. And from what happened in the winter storm, you know, og was both taking power, purchasing power from other providers and selling power to other providers right. too. All, you know, it's, it's a real time market. And of course at that time, real time prices were just crazy. And so SPP still has to finish its kind of settling of that market because they're the person in charge of like, say, Okay, you paid them, paid them here, and then here, and then here, and here. Let's all settle up, and they're going to keep doing that settlement process until February next year. They're they're estimating so a whole year to take that settlement. So we don't exactly know. Like right now, you know, OGN said a billion dollars. You know, eight hundred and thirty-eight is the latest, I think, right. for the Oklahoma portion that they were using for fuel. But you know, just this summer they got a hundred million dollars back. Right. From SPP on the settlement markets. And so, you know, that process, of, you know, ideally that will go down and, you know, SPP is not going to come back and say, okay, by the way, you owe over here. So now right. it'll go up. But I mean, I think the stipulation kind of puts that in place where, like, if there's an SPP credit, so to say, for OGE, that will lower the price of the, the final bond amount. But, you know, at well, the same this... point, still basically doing the same thing. It's just right. a smaller amount over the same period of time. But, but this is where, I mean, like securitization, and it, we can talk about all the players. I don't want to like make people's heads explode. I mean, Southwest Power Pool, I, I, we did a show on it, I don't know, last a couple weeks ago, where I had some slides that laid out all that. So if, if people want to check it out, check out our YouTube or go back. We, we keep a, a vlog of all of our stuff. But, you know, th there are so many players involved. And the issue gets to be is, is like, what, who has the power to do what? And so like, you know, the governor, executive branch probably has some power. They're not doing anything that we can find. The legislature really went hard on the, just the securitization thing. And to me, as you know, a progressive voice out here in the ether, like, you know, I would have liked to seen a little more conversation about, like, instead of just securitizing this debt and get, creating a debt instrument on the backs of ratepayers, like, it would be really great if you figured out how the heck prices got as high as they did and... You know, if it's not a state thing that you can do here, you know, be working it out with the feds, you know, to create, because now there's like, well, maybe we'll put price caps in or, you know, like, but I would have liked to see more effort by the legislature to do um, preventative work. You know, how do you stop this from happening in the future? But then it really comes down to, though, I mean, talking about the settlement markets, but also we still don't know who actually got paid this money is like, there's just such a basic fairness thing because the amount of money we're talking about, especially if you add it all together across o ONG, PSO, og and &E, and uh, you know, others, I mean, we're talking billions of dollars. I mean, that is like serious capital investment money. I mean, that is like, you know, multiple power plants. It's, it's like, and to just pay that to, to the profits of some, fuel seller like i mean there should just be like i mean i i don't know i mean i know like capitalism like it profits the goal and people just want to make as much money but i mean there should be like a certain level where which companies are just like yeah we don't need that much like we we worked hard you know we we ran out and did all this extra work we should make a little extra for keeping the lights on but it's like i mean there's just such a fundamental greed element here where you're just getting paid basically for doing nothing but getting lucky like you you had gas at precisely the right moment that the market broke and i mean i just think we have like as a as a society like an honest conversation about that instead of just saying like well this is the process 
you know, my kid's going to be paying on this for the next 28 years. Like, that's that just seems crazy to me. And it's like nobody is having that conversation. Democrats, Republicans, it's just it, – I really struggle with that because it's, to me it's just a fundamental fairness question of like we aren't gaining anything for this. We're just paying the profits of a relatively small group of people for not doing anything. And, I, you know, it's basically that simple. Yeah, well, they – you know, I don't think we know exactly who all got paid. On right. That. I mean, I mean so, well, I've heard it's out there. I've heard yeah. that there are invoices and you can see some but, of that. Yeah, and obviously OG and E knows who they wrote checks right. to. Right. Yeah. But, so I, that, I think that, that is probably what I expected more of an investigative process from the legislature to do maybe it was a, or the AG's office to kind of say, look, you know, that was historic and it was a, a, a terrible cold storm that affected a lot of things and a lot of people, but you know, we can't let this happen again. I mean, I don't know if the stipulation studying part is that part of it. Cause I don't think that ever gets into that. It's basically like what LG and E should be doing down the road. It's not. Oh really no, no, it does. Like, um, here, let me, uh, here let, is, is section six. I'll pull it up on the screen so viewers can see, but I'll just read it off because it is not very long. Mitigation of customer costs. The stipulating parties agree that OG and E should engage, should engage in the following to mitigate costs to customers. OG and E shall engage interested stakeholders in a meeting to discuss methods to mitigate cost to customers of natural gas price volatility and future cold weather events. And then OG and E shall evaluate its use of natural gas storage services and physical and financial hedging related to natural gas. Um, blah 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 for the next fuel supply portfolio risk management. Anyway, it goes. So that's it. I mean, shall I mean? I guess it's better than May, uh, but Dana Murphy even asked, I mean, like, what is that going to look like? And got basically a non-answer. I mean, you know, like, we'll get people together. Everybody in this room will be there. <laughs> like, they were like, mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're inviting everyone here. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's what all we need, guys. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you're right. There are a lot of people who just want this to be over with and, you know, which, you know, we've already gone through it and went through it in the time of COVID and other stuff going on. And so like, you know, but the, the, the push to kind of get it wrapped up in a bow and, you know, just seems to be without a ton of answers um, on that part of it, on the gas sales side of it. I mean, for sure. I mean, og &E's obviously told you or told people in this case how they dealt with it internally and what they did, you know, to try and mitigate it and they kept the lights on but you know the sales th th this is a fuel cost issue and yeah. if you're not going to be asking questions about the fuel costs then we're just dealing with the after effects of that really right now yeah and and you know the point i keep trying to make is just that it's so much money that it's like you i mean i don't know what the cost to weatherize stuff is but it's like for the amount of money we just paid in these fuel charges like you probably could have weatherized like most of the infrastructure in the state to a degree enough to have never had a problem. I mean, like it's that much money that we've spent yeah. and, 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 and like OG and even put a thing out. I basically saying that demand only went up like 14% during the whole crisis, you know, I guess above normal, but it cost went up a thousand percent. And so, I mean, it, you know, again, it's like, we didn't even use that much more fuel. I mean, we use more probably proportionally to, the temperature to keep you know it habitable for humans so people didn't freeze to death we, it's not like we used hundreds of times as much gas as we typically do it's like we used slightly more than a you know typical cold winter right yeah, and the costs were just sky high so yeah yeah so i mean it's like we just paid for the broken market and it's like all the evidence keeps pointing back to that and yeah i mean we just we just don't have um getting near time here but I wanted to just ask, I mean, because we talked about it a little bit offline, and I think you had some, like, cool cool things to say about it. Um, talking about finance real quick, and, I, again, I don't want to, like, lose people with the, the, the details of it, but, like, one of the points that, like, Voice and other groups have made in the past in rate cases and other stuff is that og and &E is a very profitable company, right? Like, they have risen, skyrocketed their dividend over the last decade plus. Um, <coughs> like, I think it's gone up more than doubled. Um, they just raised it again two weeks ago. So, I mean, they have, like, pretty good financial 
footing. And and in this case, like they've already borrowed the money. Them, ONG, all of them, like they went out and made their fuel purchases on those cold days in February. So they were good. I mean, basically the market looked at them and said, y'all are good for this. Here's your gas. Yeah, here's your money. Go buy your gas, whatever. <coughs> You'll, we'll figure it out. So now for the, and, I, and obviously it's in statute that they can come back and recover fuel costs, but it does sort of like, there is sort of this question of like, do, do even the utilities need this stuff? Because if they already have the financial capability to go out and do this, you know, I don't know. Maybe they need to share some of this cost, given the prudence and reasonableness argument. So I, I don't know. What, what are your What are your thoughts on sort of the finance side? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge finance expert, but like I, I mean, just past rate cases for sure. You know, they're the shareholders themselves. I mean, obviously, that's a very distinct group, separate from the customers, which have we're our own interests, obviously, but. You know, the shareholders don't like seeing a company go on credit negative or credit watches. And that's what happened with OG&E in this case. I mean, they went out and bought, you know, they, they ha- bought all this fuel. They kept the lights on, you know, um, kept things running. But they also like pulled down a billion dollars in credit from the facility. They have, you know, it's like having a credit card limit. I mean, they have it's not it's not that simple, obviously, but they had. They basically put a billion dollars on their credit card and they had they were good enough risk before that that they had that ability to do that um you know the other companies were the same way so they've they've paid for that and it's on their credit card essentially um but you know doing it the securitization way means that now you know that bond is on the state of oklahoma um, right. And it's a promise to pay that back rather than going out to the market where you, you know, might get a better deal maybe on a bond deal. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't priced it out. Like if they wanted to do this on a, a private bond, what that would be. Did anyone ask them if they wanted to do that? Or was this law just passed so that that would be the default? And I, I mean, a it's, rate and a private as crazy bond? as it sounds, I really think now based on this 28 year term that the whole reason this law was passed was to get the price per month down under like $5 a month. Like I really think this entire insane exercise has just been like, well, if we make the numbers small enough, nobody will care about it, which to me is so nuts from like a political standpoint, because it just, it just suggests that you have such a low opinion of voters, like basic understanding of like how the world works. Like that it's like, we're going to be fooled because you got it down to $2 and 12 cents a month. I mean, it's like, we know we're paying on it for 28 years. Like we're not, like we all we have car loans, people. Like we we you know we know how getting a five year loan, a six year loan, an eight year, a ten year loan. Like we know how that works. So it's not. I, I don't know. That's my maybe very cynical tinfoil hat opinion. Yeah, I mean it's different from a mortgage. I mean your mortgage might be thirty years, but at the end of the day, you have a house that's paid for right. it's still in value. Right. You know. Yeah, this is just dead debt. Grandfather's yeah. gasoline. I like I like that. I like that. I like that example. Paying for grandpa's gasoline. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, and I don't know that there is a mechanism. I mean, other than them just like rejecting this outright and forcing OG and E to like reanalyze their options and maybe be like, fine, we'll just eat some of this or, you know, I, I don't know. Like, yeah, um, I, 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 I will know. say that having covered rate cases in the past and, and, you know, there is a certain level of, Ask for the moon and you'll get, you know, maybe not the moon. Yeah, so like that's they, there's always politics. a we're out there that's, that they say, well, we're going to start with this because we need this, this, and this, and this. And then it gets chiseled away. And by the end of the day, people think, well, it wasn't as much as it could have been. And everyone thinks it's a win. But, you know, that's that, that's a narrative that's it's always out there. And that's not unique to utility. Right. Radio, obviously, like that's any kind of negotiation you're usually in. Um but I mean, I think that's why the Corporation Commission is there. So they do have a lot of power to ask the tough questions in this specific case. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the three commissioners are in there are voted in, you know, by the voters. And so I believe maybe we have an open seat next year. Um, I think yep. maybe Dana Murphy is termed yeah. out. 
Okay, not Bob Etsy yet? Uh, he, I think, like, very weirdly, his electoral schedule was just such that he managed to, like, somehow miss term limits. I don't think he's actually up till 2024. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure. I've, I've tried to look at this carefully, but I'm pretty sure Dana Murphy is the one who's actually, just because she got elected, anyway, just early enough to not count or term limits. Anyway. It's a weird deal. But maybe it is Bobby. And I, I'm pretty sure it's Santa Murphy who's out. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's where voters, if they're not happy with the direction that the commission is taking, then that's that's definitely a way that they should pay attention to that race. I mean, it is not the 100%. most glamorous of state jobs. It's not really a great springboard to any other, you know. Paul, you're a man after my own heart. <laughs> no, I, I love this. I mean, I, the Corporation Commission is extremely powerful. And, yeah, I mean, this is – this. I mean, we, we talked about it a little bit offline, but the ice storm, I mean, like, we're, there's still – Lots of questions around that, like whether or not OG&E should like consider burying some lines or investing a little bit more in like neighborhood infrastructure, so that you know. I mean, I think you mentioned you lost power for damn near two weeks. You know, yeah, like that's days at least. Yeah, and that was you know right around the election before and after. So it's like, and you know, the the coldness in February, we've kept our power on. It was just. A little nerve-wracking after what we've been through in, in the ice storm, but yeah. you know, I'm glad we still had power then. I mean, then we had natural gas service too, but you know, we're we're gonna be paying those bills, <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and and I think you know, from a from a consumer standpoint, I mean, that's a point I tried to make in public comments and various pieces that have been put out there is is that like we aren't the experts on this, you know, like we get our bill and pay it every month. And we have an expectation of reliability and obviously safety and health and all that. So it's like, you know, if, if the companies fail to deliver on that, I mean, to me, it's like, that's on you. Like that's, that is literally your job. That's why we pay you. So it's like, you can't just come back and be like, well, you know, oops, (laughs) you know, we, we went and bought $750 million worth of gas that, you know, we maybe shouldn't have. Sorry, (laughs) our bad. Um, well, just to wrap up here, I want to show two things real quick. I, I pulled an article from 2001, uh, OK Regulators Put a Stop to ONG's Winter Gas Cost Recovery. Um, Bob Anthony was still on then, um, so he was one of them. But yeah, I mean, they, it was like a 30-some million, so much smaller deal, but they just they just said, nah, you guys didn't, no. didn't meet the threshold that we believe you should have, and said no. And then... Um, just wanted to show Voices press release real quick for people if you haven't checked them out, Voice OKC, but um, them, AARP, um, you know, uh, the attorney for AARP did a cross-examination of OG&E uh, at the hearing on Wednesday, really asked a lot of tough questions that, you know, it would have been nice if the AG was asking and some others, but, you know, there there are advocates in the room. Right. Um, yeah, and that's another avenue, too. I mean, if if... if- you think the HG should be weighing in. He is elected official too. He has constituencies he wants to pay attention to. You not only lobby the commissioners, but talk yeah. to the AG and say, hey, are you going to say anything about this stipulation or are you just going to let it slide? Like, what's going yeah. on here? Make them answer the questions too as a, as a constituent. See, and that's the exhausting thing to me politically about this is there's so many, there's so many groups involved and so much like plausible deniability that it's like, it becomes kind of exhausting for like a, a citizen to be like, who do I even advocate with? Because it's like every group can kind of has a little slice of the pie and can, and really honestly share some of the blame for this. Um, but yes, I agree. AG is definitely one. Um, I think we really just got hosed on timing with that. Cause I think Mike Hunter would have been a, a significantly more in tune on this and, and interested in it for lots of reasons politically too. I mean, he has probably, probably had at the time higher aspirations. Um, but yeah, I still think corporation commissions got, you know, a pretty, pretty good angle on this. Any, any final thoughts or anything you want to add or? No, I mean, I, I appreciate other people taking interest in this. I mean, you know, I've covered this stuff in previous life and, you know, I always thought you were kind of just screaming into the void on a lot of this stuff, which I mean, which is very important consumer issues. I mean, people get really upset about their cell phone bills. Um, they get upset about, you know, anything that they, they don't think is justified. And that, that sometimes that just adding air is justified, you know, and that's, that's, um, you know, you do have a voice in this and groups like 
voice, um, shining light on stuff like this and keeping it in the, in the news, I think is a good thing as well. So, Thanks for watching our video. Please give it a like and hit that subscribe button for more content. If you want to engage with us, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and Instagram.